This week on To the Contrary. First, prosecutions for Texans who try to enforce the new bill that almost bans abortions in the state. How did pro-choice activists screw up to get to this point? Oh, Bonnie, I don't think that's a fair question at all. And the Taliban whips female Afghan protesters calling for women's rights. Very much a moment to show the West in a very, uh, you know, convoluted way who won in the end. I'm Bonnie Urbay. Welcome to To the Contrary, a weekly discussion of news and social trends from diverse perspectives of first abortion rights. The governor of Texas has defended his state's strict anti-abortion law, arguing against the need for exceptions for rape or incest. Governor Greg Abbott promised he would instead, quote, work tirelessly to make sure we eliminate all rapists from the streets of Texas, end quote. The law bans abortion after a doctor can detect a heartbeat in the fetus, typically around six weeks. But many women don't even know if they're pregnant by their sixth week. The U.S. Supreme Court's conservative majority refused to block the bill. At least 12 other states have passed similar laws, but still face legal challenges. And Christy Nome, the governor of South Dakota, is making it almost impossible for women there to seek doctor's visits for chemical or medical abortions. Joining me today are Rena Shah Barara, former Congresswoman Donna Edwards, the Center for Equal Opportunities Linda Chavez, and Aaron Matson, the co-founder of Repro Action. Welcome to all of you. And Aaron, you first. How did pro-choice activists screw up to get to this point? Oh, Bonnie, I don't think that's a fair question at all. I think the issue is how out of touch have conservatives gotten on abortion? The fact is they're way over their skis on this. And we're seeing national outrage around the country to this idea that abortion could be revoked and legal abortion could be revoked. But I wanna point out something very important. You saw that Governor Christy Nome out of South Dakota immediately responded to the Texas six week abortion ban before many people even know that they're pregnant, by the way. Uh, that she responded to that with restrictions on telemedicine abortion in her state. I right, wanna so say something- She's making it impossible. She's making it impossible for women to use RU486 or Plan B um, if they live in South Dakota? Well, she, in terms of medical abortion, Plan B is actually emergency contraception that stops pregnancy from occurring. But here's the deal. Governor Nome and the anti-abortion movement period, they know that abortion is unstoppable and they can ban abortion. They can keep throwing people in jail. They can sick bounty hunters on people like they have in Texas, but they cannot put abortion pills back in the bottle. We are in a different era since the pre-road days. Medication abortion is safe. It is effective. We have reams of data from overseas where uh, abortion is extremely restricted, showing that people can safely and effectively use it to end their pregnancies. So I think that sort of desperate grasp uh, by the governor of South Dakota, well, it's certainly very harmful to abortion access. In okay, okay. We need, let, let's get uh, Rena in here on this. Rena, how are you? Well, good, good. I've been a pro-choice Republican for a long time. And my answer to folks has always been that I'm pro-life for myself. I'm pro-choice for other women. And the you freedom and, of- You and Mario Cuomo, who's no longer with us. Indeed, said- indeed. The, 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 the Cuomo answer, as it's been dubbed for a long time. Right. I mean, but to, to think of it this way, um, the very fact that we have a debate about masks and, and the, the we've seen the signage that rolls out my body, my choice, that's the same argument for access to abortion services. If a woman wants to terminate a pregnancy, to me, that is a very personal decision. That's between her and her doctor. It's also between her and her God. And she may not even believe in God. And that's fine too. That is the freedom that we have in America as women. Yeah, but, but tell me about conservatives who are uncomfortable with the Texas law. I've seen several of them. Sure. Well-known conservative men say, 
We didn't want this. This is we didn't want the craziness that this law point appointing vigilantes, paying them state dollars to go after people. We didn't want this. It's not constitutional and it shouldn't be there. Well, more than the craziness, Bonnie, it's the cruelty. It seems that this was really intended to punish women and all those around them that may have some hand in helping that woman find access to abortion services. And that is the cruelty. Also, the cruelty, it seems, that comes when you talk about the victims of incest and rape. And that's why we heard Governor Abbott say what he said this past week. So I, I think we live in an era where it's, it's not... Um, let me put it this way. It, it certainly was not on my bingo card for 2021 to hear the abortion debate come back so red hot because of what's happening in Texas. But it's not uncommon to hear conservatives say that they are fine with women going to seek abortions in the cases of incest and rape. That's actually been standard for a very okay. long time. All right, Donna, you're a Democratic Party insider. I remember the days in the 70s, right after Roe v. Wade was um handed down by the Supreme Court when women felt very secure in their right to abortion. The Catholic Church was, uh, I've done a lot of reporting on this, taken aback, didn't, uh, didn't see Roe coming. And ever since then, the church and the uh, evangelicals, the anti-abortion religious forces, because let's be real, this is a religious war, um, have been making incremental, incremental gains, and now they control the situation. Why didn't pro-choice Democrats use some kind of methodology that would have turned the country more pro-choice as opposing, as opposed to losing the support of a lot of Americans? Let's be clear, um, Americans actually are overwhelmingly pro-choice. A majority, a, a, a strong majority of Americans uh, support the precepts of the constitutional right to an abortion enshrined in Roe v. Wade. Um, on the political end, that is where the challenge is. And I, I agree, I remember many years ago, actually standing on the corner on Pennsylvania Avenue when um, abortion restrictions were imposed against poor women who were no longer able to use public benefits to get an abortion. The high I, that was the slippery slope and we have to fight back. And I think right now the onus is going to be on, uh, particularly on Democrats in the House and the Senate to codify Roe v. Wade. And that is a very heavy lift at this stage, but it's not because the American people do not support the idea that a woman should be able to choose what she does with her body and has a right to an abortion. So Linda, is this a tyranny of the minority? Well, I'll tell you one thing. I think that uh, Republicans were too clever by half with this bill. I think what they're going to do is motivate uh, particularly young people and young women uh, to go to the polls. Uh, abortion, uh, which has often been fought. You mean, uh, you're various... talking about young Democrats to vote No, Democratic. I'm talking about young women in general, including some Republicans. Uh, Rena is not the only, you know, pro-choice Republican out there. I think the, look, yes, America has generally been in favor of abortion under certain circumstances. They may not have gone as far as the Democratic uh, Party platform uh, used to go, which was basically from birth uh, conception to birth, uh, abortion was available. Uh, there have been restrictions put in place, and some of those restrictions are restrictions that Americans support, including, you know, uh, what are called partial birth abortions or very late term abortions, which, by the way, are very there are not very many of those that are. Uh, no, it's a total red born. herring. It's it's a red herring. But but my point. Is is that um, there, there is a kind of middle ground. I think most Americans, they may not think it's moral, they may not like the practice, but they don't want to outlaw it, particularly in the first term. And I think uh, this Texas law is bizarre. You're essentially creating a tort that doesn't exist. I mean, if I don't like it because some woman in Texas is getting an abortion, what damage is done to me that I can go and claim ten thousand dollars? I mean that this is a well, will, but will bizarre. And the Justice Department announced late late this week that it was going to start prosecuting, uh, which was a signal that the uh, abortion rights movement wanted 
uh, Merritt Garland, the the uh, attorney general, to send to Texans who would be vigilantes. Will this be enough, Aaron? Do you think to back them off from trying to prosecute, you know, from being vigilantes, from taking the law into their own hands? Oh, I would never count on the humanity of the anti-abortion movement, Bonnie. What we have seen at every turn is that they are extremely vicious toward people and their right to control their own destinies. I think that what we're gonna see in Texas or what's coming out of Texas, we're gonna see happen in a number of states around the country that are gonna copycat because this rogue Supreme Court allowed this uh, clearly unconstitutional law um, to go into effect in the dark of night. Um, tell, me, tell me and tell the audience what exactly about it is unconstitutional. Sure. Well, a six-week abortion ban clearly violates Roe versus Wade. In fact, the Supreme Court is due to hear a 15-week abortion ban upcoming this fall. And so they're contesting the constitutionally constitutionality of that while letting this six-week ban go into effect in, in Texas for what they claim are procedural reasons. But let's be real. This is what Trump promised. This is what uh, conservatives counted on him to deliver. And Amy Coney Barrett was installed to deliver the result that we now see this catastrophic horror in Texas that is especially impacting low-income people and people of color. Could, could I just step in here, Bonnie, for a second? Because I don't actually agree that what the Supreme Court uh, did uh, last week was all that unusual. The problem is this law, law is so out of the bounds in terms of normal legal precedents that the abortion providers did not even know whom to sue because there had not yet been the ban. Someone had not tried to interfere with the person uh, being able to obtain an abortion. And so they basically said, we don't yet have a case. So, I, you know, I, I am not at all certain that all six of um, the, you know, uh, conservatives on the court would vote to uphold this law. I don't think that you're, um, they're refusing to hear the case. You have to remember that back during the debate over the right of homosexuals to marry, uh, the court refused to hear a case there where um, marriage certificates were being denied, and the court ultimately uh, decided that there was a constitutional right. Right, and, and, and there, there are three uh, reliable liberals on the court, right. and it's expected that uh, Chief Justice John Roberts would join them just to stop the chaos that could ensue uh, if the country thinks that women's abortion rights are at issue and the damage possibly to the Republican Party at, at the electoral, uh, at the polls. But let me get to that. There, we're, in a, we're in an off-year election now uh, in Virginia, my home state, where Terry McAuliffe, the former governor, is being challenged by an unknown, a guy named Youngkin, uh, who is a, who is pretty much, follows everything that President Trump followed in, in terms of policy and, and particularly on abortion. Terry McAuliffe is now campaigning, saying, if you elect him, there goes abortion in Virginia. And, and abortion has never been or hasn't been for since literally decades ago, a, an issue upon which women reliably voted. They care much more about things like uh, you know, ha be feeling secure in their homes, having an economy that's providing jobs and, and is keeping uh, things going economically. So is this a time, Erin, when you think, uh, or I'm sorry, Donna, when you think uh, that finally women are gonna start voting on abortion because they wanna preserve it, they see it going down the drain? Well, I, I think part of the reason that abortion hasn't been sort of front and center on the ballot is because it's never been on the ballot like it will be right now. And I think to uh, Linda's point, this is a gift really to Democrats um, who are running because um, they share the sentiment of the American public. And I think it will be galvanizing, particularly for young people, for young women, but also for young men. The first phone call I got when this Texas case came out was from my son who supports a woman's right to, to choose. And so I think this can be quite motivating at, at the polls and you know, Democrats just got a gift, sad as it is. 
All right, we're out of time on this topic. Aaron Matson, thank you so much for joining us from Texas to Afghanistan. Taliban fighters have responded to protests from Afghan women who don't want their hard-won rights stolen from them with whips and sticks. This is the latest in a series of crackdowns by the new all-male hardline government. Women routinely worked while the U.S. was occupying Afghanistan, and many held important positions in government, banking, law, medicine, and academe. Now these women are being told to return home. The protests erupted after the U.S. withdrew from Afghanistan shortly before the 20th anniversary of 9-11. Meanwhile at home, families of victims from the 2001 attacks on the World Trade Center grieved for their lost loved ones. Joining our panel now is Manal Omar, founder of Across Red Lines. Thank you, Manal, for joining us. Please tell us what, what happens to Afghan women now? Well, I think that we're back, Barney, to seeing Afghan women on the political stage in terms of theatrics, both from U.S. politics to European to Afghanistan. Everyone is somehow involved. Uh, you mentioned before on the previous segment about, you know, religion's war on women. Uh, we're seeing a different form play out in Afghanistan. And I would say war on women in general with religion is one of the tools. All right. And do you, so what do you think is going to happen? These Afghani women are protests. I heard an interview with one who said, we're going to do this whether we're wounded, whether we die. Um, and with the Taliban in power, even though they promised a more lenient government, do you see that coming to fruition? I don't see it coming to fruition because we have a whole the problem of definitions, right? From the very beginning, we don't know what Islamic law they're discussing um, in terms of lenient or not lenient. Uh, we've seen very monolithic, strict interpretations come from the Taliban, and there's no indication that they wouldn't do so. Uh, and it's really important not to look at it as women and religion. This is very much a moment to show the West in a very, uh, you know, convoluted way who won in the end. And you see that from the appoint appointments as well. Some of the people appointed to this interim Taliban government were among the most wanted. So it's a very much in your face type of policy. And women knowing how sensitive it is, is one of the most powerful ways for the Taliban to put the world uh, in perspective in terms of who actually won the 20 year war. Okay. Uh, and you, Donna Edwards, while you were in the House of representatives. You went to Afghanistan four times. You met with the NGO women leaders there. Tell me what you think is happening to them. What have you heard from them, uh, if anything, and how do they move forward? Well, I, I think that Manal hit it right on the head, and that is that um, the Taliban is the same old Taliban. They might, you know, portray themselves or try to portray themselves slightly differently, but we can see the way that they're behaving on the ground. And the reality is that from years uh, back when the negotiations first began with the Taliban, women leaders were excluded from those early negotiations. And so it is not a surprise at all that the Taliban has instituted its new ministers with uh, who are all men who are some of the most heinous um, uh, actors within the Taliban. And so I, I have heard from some of my, you know, former um, uh, colleagues, I will describe them, former women parliamentarians and NGO leaders, and I fear for them, but we also have a new generation of women in Afghanistan who for 20 years have been business leaders, they've been in law enforcement, they've been in every sector of government, uh, and they're educated. And I think that we have a new generation of activists who are not going to let up and will continue to let the world see the Taliban uh, for what it is. And there has to be pressure uh, from the United States and, um, and other allied governments put on Afghanistan, you know, not releasing their, their money as long as they continue to hold Afghan women down. Okay, but they should, I mean, what do you specifically, do you believe the US government owes to Afghani women? Because the Taliban, can live without our money. They make their money off drugs. They're drug traffickers uh, of the worst sort. So we can withhold 
funds, we can lock up their bank accounts, what have you, they're still going to be there. What should we do about that? What do we have a duty to do about that? I, I think we have a duty, Bonnie, to uh, admit as many women from Afghanistan who want to come here to allow them to come. I mean, I really believe that uh, a lot of people say, well, the war in Afghanistan, $2 trillion, maybe even $4 trillion, we didn't accomplish anything. I'm sorry, we did accomplish one very important thing. We educated a whole generation of girls and women. We gave them an idea that they could be something more than prisoners in their home uh, subject to the whims of, of their male family members. And so I think you're right. And I think Don is absolutely right that the Taliban, they have not changed, but the country has changed. Half of the population has changed. Now, not all of the girls of Afghanistan in some of the small villages, et cetera, uh, were able to modernize and get educated, but many were. And so I think that, you know, one of the great things about this country is we have taken in refugees. We have allowed people who are fleeing oppression to come here. And I would hope that in addition to giving the SIV special immigrant visas to people who aided the US uh, in Afghanistan, that we also create a special visa for young women, women who want to get out of that situation. Uh, then of course, it's gonna be difficult sometimes to get them out, um, but at least let's, let's make a mechanism, let's give a pathway for those who want to, to leave to be able to come here. All right, Rina, can... uh, do, you think, do you see that happening? Do you see U.S. policy shifting towards the caring about the future of the Afghan women whom it helped liberate by educating them? You know, I get a strong sense from this administration that they do care about that. And I know that many will feel that this entire operation was totally messed up. Uh, Look, I mean, this was the card that Joe Biden was dealt, and this was never going to end well, in my opinion. It's a tragedy of, of great proportion, but we can make it right. Secretary Blinken is still taking time to consider and, and taking steps to consider. Do we even recognize the Taliban as a legitimate government? Do we believe them the, when their walk isn't matching the talk? I care about those women that both Donna and, and Linda talked about because they came of age in these past 20 years. They got to see a different life. And it's as if the hands of time have just turned back on them. So we should not abandon them. It's actually our responsibility to do something for those women who want to do more for themselves because if they stay in these situations where sometimes now they're the majority breadwinners for their family, they know that this Taliban does not want a better life for them because of their gender. So we as Americans, uh, I, I really believe in the American spirit. We will coalesce uh, around the Afghan refugees. And I think we will put pressure on our federal government to do the right thing, to use diplomatic channels and get okay. those who want to come out, out. Okay. And Manal, okay. Uh, uh, I throw the final question to you. Are you as optimistic as Rena and Linda seem to be that women will be able to pro keep the protests going and keep the, the Taliban at bay in some way. I, I'm optimistic, but for different reasons. Um, I'm optimistic because I'm a peace builder and that's kind of what we have to do is create optimism and hope. I think the Afghan women will continue to struggle in spite of us. I think we need to really own that we put the Afghan women and several other women, if we look at Iraq and Libya in terms of our interventions in danger, and we need a two-pronged approach, not only pulling the refugees out, but what will we do to protect those who stay? I mean, the amount of brain drain that's taking place, which is secondary, protection is always first, and I think you know, anyone who wants to leave should get first priority. I think that uh, the most important thing is obviously going to be protection, but we're not doing enough for protection for the women who want to stay. And those who stay, that's where we'll have long-term sustainable change for the women. Let's not forget, Afghan women have always been powerful. It's not just the last two decades the way people like to portray. It's been for centuries. It was just the wars and the Taliban that sent women back. Okay, but without any people on the ground in Afghanistan, without diplomats, without military uh, troops, how are you thinking we should get this done? I think the most important thing is supporting those on the ground. I mean, we've built local partners. There have always been very strong civil society and activists in Afghanistan. 
we need to continue to find ways, again, of protecting, but also supporting them as they run their programs. We don't need the expats and the diplomats that we need. If anything, they've always been the implementers in the way that things run because of remote management of the dangers in Afghanistan. Okay, that's it for this edition. Thank you all, that was terrific. Please join us in the interim and continue the conversation on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. And whether you agree or think to the contrary, see you next time. Funding for To the Contrary provided by the E. Rhodes and Leona B. Carpenter Foundation, the Colcom Foundation, and the Charles A. Freoff Foundation. For a transcript or to see an online version of this episode of To the Contrary, please visit our PBS website at pbs.org forward slash to the contrary. PBS.